and the senators who negotiated this legislation show how to get things done. The senators in our group of 10 effectively represented the needs of the regions we represent. Senator Cassidy in the Deep South, Senator Warner in the Mid-Atlantic, Senator Manchin in Appalachia, and Senators Romney and Tester in the West. And the Northeast and Alaska, each with unique needs, were ably represented by Senators Shaheen, Collins, and Murkowski, the wonder women of our group, always focused on the practical outcomes. And I sincerely thank my partner in co-leading this long effort, Senator Rob Portman, whose knowledge of the federal budget is matched only by his steadfast commitment to delivering on this priority for America. Delivering this legislation for the American people, this is what it looks like when elected leaders set aside differences, shut out the noise, and focus on delivering results on the issues that matter most to everyday Americans. I look forward to the work that we will all do together to implement this historic legislation. Thank you. Please welcome Senator Rob Portman. Kirsten, thank you very much, and it was great being your partner in this. I've heard you say, in fact, I've heard President Biden say that this infrastructure bill that will be signed today is going to have a positive impact on every single American, and that's true. This is true today. It will be true for decades to come, and I want to congratulate everyone gathered here today for the role you played in making this possible. This is what can happen when Republicans and Democrats decide we're going to work together to get something done. The bipartisan process that resulted in this historic investment began with a meeting about eight months ago with my colleague, Senator Sinema, whose persistence was absolutely key to us being here today. We met, frankly, in response to the initial Biden infrastructure plan which included tax increases and also included substantial investments in so-called human infrastructure. By removing the tax hikes and shrinking the passage, the package to only fund core infrastructure, we saw an opportunity to find bipartisan consensus on finally fixing our nation's outdated infrastructure. And from there, the group quickly grew to the G10 negotiators. They were just mentioned, but I got to mention them again. Senators. Susan Collins, Mitt Romney, Lisa Murkowski, Bill Cassidy, Joe Manchin, Gene Shaheen, Mark Warner, and John Tester. Five Republicans and five Democrats. It ultimately grew to 22 senators, evenly divided by party and a partnership with the House Problem Solvers Caucus, led by Brian Fitzgerald and Josh Gottheimer. Give them a round of applause. Senator Mitch McConnell, to his credit, supported our efforts to find a way forward and eventually lent his critical support. Senator Shelley Moore Capito helped lay the foundation for our success in her White House discussions and also in her committee work with Senator Tom Carper. <laughs> our work was guided by a few simple principles, core infrastructure only, no tax increases, and no linkage to the broader partisan reconciliation process. Instead, we agreed this would be a truly bipartisan process, working from the middle out, not the top down. There were plenty of bumps along the way, but we got there because we were all committed to ultimately delivering a result for the constituents we represent. We also got there because of a lot of smart, hardworking staff, as usual. I want to commend my team, as well as the staff of our G10 members, and I want to commend the White House negotiators led ably by Steve Reschetti and supported by Brian Deese. Every president and every Congress in modern times has proposed major infrastructure improvements. They all have. By making infrastructure a real priority in his administration, President Trump furthered the discussion and helped Republicans like me think differently about the positive impact of investment in core infrastructure. 
And core infrastructure is what this law is all about. It's about roads and bridges and rail and transit and ports and airports and water systems, the electric grid, broadband, and more. We've got a major bridge in my hometown, and it's also a major bottleneck, desperately in need of replacing. We've been trying to do it for 25 years, but we haven't been able to pull together the funding and figure out how to do it. This new law finally gives us the tools we need to fix the Brent Spence Bridge, and the same is true for major projects all around the country. That's why you see so many of my colleagues here from every region of the country, because they know this is going to help to create more economic efficiency, more productivity, and maybe lessen that commute for their constituents. This long-term investment in our nation's capital assets will grow the economy because of that efficiency and that productivity. It'll create hundreds of thousands of new jobs. It'll make us more competitive against countries like China, who are investing heavily in infrastructure, much more than we have been. Maybe most importantly, at a time of surging inflation, these long-term investments are actually going to help. Inflation, of course, is caused when demand outstrips supply. And in this case, we're not funding stimulus spending that adds to the demand side, but ports and freight rail and roads and bridges and other assets that will help on the supply side. That's why economists say this bill is counter-inflationary, which is so important right now, as American families are facing higher prices on everything from gas to groceries. This new law also includes landmark permitting reforms to reduce timelines for infrastructure projects while maintaining environmental and safety standards. We want taxpayer-funded infrastructure projects to be done as cost-effectively as possible, right? Get them done on time and under budget. This bipartisan support for this bill comes because it makes sense for our constituents. But the approach from the center out should be the norm, not the exception. The increasing polarization of our country is keeping us from getting things done. And we have a responsibility to do better. The American people want us to see us coming together. They know that despite our differences, we should be able to figure it out and work together to solve big problems. We can start by recognizing that finding common ground to advance the interests of the American people should be rewarded, not attacked. Mr. President, uh, in a moment you're going to sign this bill. I will say that you and I will disagree on the tax and spending and the other priority you have, the reconciliation bill, but I think we can both agree that this infrastructure investment shouldn't be a one-time bipartisan accomplishment. This should be the beginning of a renewed effort to work together on big issues facing our country. Again, I want to thank everybody who's here today for what you did to make this possible. Thank you. We need no Please, Please welcome, welcome Senate, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for inviting us to the White House. Thank you to Vice President Harris, my colleagues in attendance, all of you, and Senator Sinema Portman and Speaker Pelosi. Now, for years, Americans were promised that an infrastructure bill was coming. Today, we're telling the American people that an infrastructure bill is finally here. Thank you, President Biden. At the start of this year, we told American families that we'd meet our challenges, the challenges of our time, with boldness and with courage. Now they're getting one of the largest infrastructure bills ever. To paraphrase one of my favorite former vice presidents, it's a big effing deal. <laughs> there isn't a community in America, not a city, not a town, or rural hub that doesn't have some glaring infrastructure problem requiring immediate intent, immediate attention. Busted roads make it harder for people to get to work. Dilapidated schools make it harder for kids to learn. Overtaxed seaports and railways and airports make it harder for goods to get to market, hurting businesses, raising prices on consumers, and hurting our economy. If America is to compete in this century, 
We can't do it with an infrastructure that's stuck in the last century. This infrastructure bill will help us meet the challenges of our time, strengthen our crucial supply chains, and lay the foundation for another generation of economic prosperity. This bill can be summed up by a four-letter word, J-O-B-S. Jobs, jobs, and more local jobs, more good-paying jobs, more union jobs. This bill will benefit every state, every state, in very significant ways. In New York, my New York, major projects have been stalled for so long, like Gateway, the Cross Bronx Expressway, the Second Avenue Subway, I-81 in Syracuse, the Inner Loop in Rochester, will all have the ability to get going. And there are projects as important as these in every state across the country. Today's infrastructure bill will also begin the necessary efforts to prevent the worst of climate change, putting thousands of Americans to work by investing in resilience in our buildings, and crucially, beginning our task to make America's transportation system clean. It will finally bring millions of Americans online with high-speed internet, both in rural and underserved communities. New York alone still has over one million households without access or a subscription to broadband. We'll also help eliminate lead pipes in our water system, so one day parents won't have to worry if their kids are getting sick every time they turn on the faucet. Cities like Rochester still have 25,000 lead pipes that need replacement, 25,000. And today's legislation will also make driving safer in America. It'll require new cars to install drunk driving prevention technology, and it will make dangerous largely unregulated vehicles like limos safer to use on the road. In the audience today, we have a great New Yorker, my friend Kevin Cushing. Kevin, where are you amid this big crowd? Thank you, Kevin. He's way back there. Kevin is the father of Patrick Cushing. He died, through, Patrick died three years ago when he and 19 friends from the Amsterdam, New York area were celebrating a birthday and they were killed in a limo crash in Schaharie. As the president deeply understands, that's, that is a loss no parent should endure. It was horrific, preventable tragedy stemming from outdated federal rules and loopholes that allowed dangerous limos to operate on the road unchecked. In the face of the loss, rather than curse the darkness, Kevin, and the families impacted that day lit a candle. Every day since that accident, they have pushed every single senator to support changes in our laws to make these vehicles safer to ride in. Today, their perseverance has paid off. Kevin, my friend, it was an honor to fight alongside you, and today Patrick is smiling down with pride. So, Mr. President, thank you for your leadership in achieving this long-sought goal on a bipartisan basis. The benefits go on and on. Thank you to all of my colleagues who pushed this infrastructure bill over the finish line, including our committee chairs and Speaker Pelosi, and everyone who reached across the aisle on this bipartisan achievement. Today's signing is a major and historic step forward, and we will keep working with you, Mr. President, to build on today's success by passing the rest of your Build Back Better agenda in the weeks ahead so we can keep our promises to help families achieve the American dream. Thank you, everybody. This is a great day for America. Please welcome Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much uh, to everyone who made today possible. I especially want to acknowledge President Biden for the glorious vision and the great commitment that he had 
to bring this legislation forward for the people. It is a great achievement. Thank you, Mr. President. When our nation was experiencing the depths of pandemic and economic crisis, you knew, Mr. President, that we needed not only to recover, but we had to seize the opportunity to build back better. Following your vision, Congress passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, an historic step to rebuild the infrastructure and the middle class. Your agenda is historic, transformative, and the biggest, boldest investment in our country's history. I just want to talk about the history for a moment. The very first major infrastructure investment was President Thomas Jefferson's. He tasked the Secretary of Treasury Gallatin for the Gallatin Project to build the infrastructure to reach into our ever-growing nation, resulting in the Erie Canal, the Cumberland Road in Maryland, and uh, uh, other initiatives. Then under President Lincoln and through legislation from Congress, America launched the Transcontinental Railroad connecting the country from coast to coast. On the 100th anniversary of the Gallatin Project, President Theodore Roosevelt established the National Park Service to preserve God's beautiful natural patrimony of our country. And then President Eisenhower, years later, established the Interstate Highway System, initially a national security initiative, but significantly connecting America for commerce and communities. And today, Mr. President, with the stroke of your pen, we will take a giant step to achieve your vision to build America's roads, bridges, water systems, and so much more, creating good paying union jobs, and <laughs> ensuring clean air and clean water, delivering better quality of life with equity, helping businesses thrive and turbocharging our global competitiveness, connecting communities again through the uh, internet and making America safety, safer as we protect our planet. And we do so building back better. This historic achievement was possible thanks to so many who have been acknowledged already, honors granted to all of them, to our chairs, members, and staff who have in every step brought a depth of knowledge, commitment, and values-based leadership that is making a difference. Especially I salute in the House Transportation Infrastructure Chair, Peter DeFazio, a maestro of all things related to infrastructure and sustainability. I do want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Clyburn, who was taking great pride, I think almost blushing, when the, our, our guest from the Carolinas was talking about uh, broadband especially, but among other things. Thank you, Mr. Clyburn, for your leadership and all of that. <laughs> May I just say and associate myself with the closing remarks of Mr. Uh, Mr. Schumer. Uh, this is a great accomplishment, and there's more to come. And so happy that hopefully this week we will be passing Build Back Better to, to give tax, tax cuts to America's working families, uh, to create millions more jobs, to lower health care costs, and all of it paid for by making everyone pay his or her own fair share. I'll close by saying last week in Glasgow at the COP26, Members were met with great enthusiasm over the Build Back Better agenda, which is a show of force to the world, as the president has said, America is back. With President Biden's signature, we show America's leadership for ourselves, for the people, and to the world. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by the Vice President of the United States and Heather Kurtenbach, a member of Iron Workers Local 86. <laughs>
welcome Heather Kurtenbach. In a moment. <laughs> Please have a seat. President Joe Biden, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Cabinet members, Congress members, governors and mayors, and, and my fellow Americans, this is an historic day. In the middle of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln started construction on the Transcontinental Railroad. In the middle of the Great Depression, President Franklin Roosevelt finished construction on the Hoover Dam. President Dwight Eisenhower signed the National Interstate and Defense Highways Act in the middle of the Cold War. And today, and today, President Joe Biden will sign the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act into law. Indeed is an historic day today. From the very start of our administration, we were determined to follow through not just on our promise to invest in our nation's infrastructure, but on the promises that the American people have heard for years now. And we would not be here today were it not for your leadership, Mr. President. From the very start, you welcomed Democrats, Independents, and Republicans to meet with us in the Oval Office. You welcomed ideas. You welcomed debate all in the service of getting this bill done. And here is what I know to be true, Mr. President. You are equal parts believer and builder. And because you are, we are all better off. On behalf of our nation, thank you, Mr. President. And of course, our administration did not arrive at this day by ourselves. We are also here because of leaders in the House and the Senate who worked on this bill together, who voted for this bill. And we are here because of the millions of Americans who believed that we could get this done. Well, we got it done, America. <laughs> we got it done. In many ways, this day embodies our character as a nation. It demonstrates exactly who we are. We are believers through and through. We see what can be unburdened by what has been. We are as bold as we are determined to do big things. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act proves that. It proves that in America, we have the courage to believe a better future is possible and to build it together. After this bill is signed into law, millions more Americans will go to work in good paying, good union jobs. <laughs> Americans like Jovan Johnson, a carpenter I met in Nevada who said that she has, quote, built her career on infrastructure and fed her family on infrastructure. Americans like Jeff Bird, a line design technician I met with in New Hampshire. He attaches fiber to utility poles to keep up with the demand for high-speed internet. Or Leslie Kilgore, an engineer I met with in North Carolina, whose team is building electric school buses or Walter Cody, a construction inspector with whom I met, who is working to get clean water to families in California. This will be a nationwide effort, the likes of which we have not seen in a generation. It will make our country more competitive, and it will deliver on our nation's and our administration's commitment to equity. Now this bill, as significant as it is, as historic as it is, is part one of two. <laughs> to lower costs and cut taxes for working families, 
To tackle the climate crisis at its core, Congress must also pass the Build Back Better Act. <clears throat> the work of building a more perfect union did not end with the railroad or the interstate. And it will not end now. So on this historic day, let us all continue to believe in our people, believe in our country, and believe in what we can do when we work together. Thank you all. May God bless you, and may God bless America. Please welcome Heather Kurtenbach. Thank you, Madam Vice President. As a proud union iron worker from Local 86 in Seattle, Washington, I am honored to be here at the White House on this historic day for workers like me and our country. I am an elected leader in my local union as a business agent and active in the Sisters Committee, which mentors newer iron workers. Before I got where I am today, however, I had to overcome some challenges. Um, in 2005, I was released from incarceration. Uh, while incarcerated, I was able to work on a wildland firefighting crew, sometimes heading out in the middle of the night to fight fires. That experience taught me a powerful work ethic and gave me lasting friendships. When I got out of prison, however, doors were closed to me. I searched for a job for six months with no offers. Um, finally, as a last ditch effort, I asked my brother-in-law, a union iron worker, excuse me. Kamala Harris moments ago, and from senators on both sides of the aisle, Republican uh, Rob Portman and Democrat Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. The president, of course, winning support from Democrats and Republicans on this. The actual price tag of the package, $1.2 trillion. It includes $110 billion for highways, bridges, and roads, $65 billion to upgrade the nation's power grid. 39 billion for public transit, 65 billion to expand uh, internet and broadband access to rural America, 55 billion for clean water. Today's signing comes amid those new poll numbers. I mentioned President Biden's overall approval rating now underwater at 41 percent, money uh, setting the economy, inflation. Americans have seen those rising prices at the gas pump and at the supermarket checkout. Democrats and Republicans who voted for the package have been invited to the White House today, and we've taken note that several Republicans are there on the South Lawn celebrating this historic achievement as well. 19 Senate Republicans and 13 House Republicans voted in favor of the infrastructure package. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who supported the bill, is not in attendance. Remember, six House Democrats voted against this uh, plan. They're holding out. They had hoped the other part of the president's agenda, the $1.75 trillion uh, Build Back Better bill is what they're calling it, would have been voted on by now in the House as well. That has not happened yet. That includes funding for universal pre-K, expanded Medicare, child care, money, of course, to fight climate change. Uh, within that, incentives for businesses and Americans uh, on that front. The president, of course, must win over members of his own party. No margin for error, particularly in the Senate, on the second part of his domestic agenda in order for that plan to succeed. We heard the Vice President Kamala Harris just moments ago in talking about this historic day and about the president saying he was willing to invite Democrats and Republicans to the Oval Office to listen to their ideas, their debate over what should ultimately be in this bill in the end. She said he's a believer uh, and a builder. Let's listen now to the comments being made by uh, the member of the Iron Local there in Seattle, Washington, but that's what's as she great introduces about America. the president. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Heather Kurtenbach, again of Seattle. Yeah. Um, but that's what's so great about America and having a president who believes someone like me should be standing here. On behalf of Local 86 in Seattle and union workers everywhere, for the faith he's placing in us, I am honored to introduce the 46th President of the United States, Joe Biden. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Heather. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Heather, you thought you're surprised you're standing here. Jill is very surprised I'm standing here. Well, Heather, thank you for the introduction. And I can't look over here because the sun's shining in my eyes, but all this other crowd over here, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all you've done. Look, uh, thanks for sharing this day with us. Why this day matters to you and our fellow, your fellow iron workers and your families, and you explained it well. For all the folks at home, I know this day matters to you as well. I know you're tired of the bickering in Washington, frustrated by the negativity, and you just want us to use and focus on your needs, your concerns, and the conversations that are taking place at your kitchen table. Conversation as profound as they are ordinary. How do I find work? How do I get there? How can our small business thrive and our child succeed in school? Or how do we emerge from this pandemic, not just with a little bit of breathing room, but with real fighting chance to get ahead? When we ran for president, to help, I thought maybe I could help answer some of those questions for you and the needs you have. Because every time I'd ride home on Amtrak, I'd go through just north of, of uh, just south of Baltimore. I'd look out, go through a suburban neighborhood. I'd look in those, all those lights are on in the windows. Nance, and I'd look and i wonder, what are they talking about? I'm serious. I swear to God. What are they talking about sitting at that table? What are they talking about? They're talking about the things that I talked about at our kitchen table, Jill at hers, and all of you as well. And that's about how can we come together? to be president for all Americans, to make sure our democracy delivers for you, for all of you. And I promised that we couldn't just build back to what it was before. We literally had to build back better. You couldn't build back. We're the only country that's always come out of great crises stronger than when we went in. And the world has changed and we have to be ready. My fellow Americans today, I want you to know we hear you and we see you. The bill I'm about to sign along is proof that despite the cynics, Democrats and Republicans can come together and deliver results. We can do this. We can deliver real results for real people. We see in ways that really matter each and every day to each person out there. And we're taking a monumental step forward to build back better as a nation. I want to thank everyone who helped make this happen. Vice President Harris, my cabinet members, my White House team, Jill, Doug, our first lady and our, our first lady and our second husband. No, I'm joking. <laughs> These guys travel all over the country together. I'm getting worried, you know. <laughs> and Doug's one hell of a lawyer besides. And everybody from the United States Senate, Majority Leader Schumer, and a group of Senate Democrats and Republicans have established this bipartisan framework, including representatives and all the folks you heard from. Senator Rob Portman is a really hell of a good guy. I, I'm not hurting you, Rob, because I know you're not running again. I, that's the only reason I say it. But you are a hell of a good guy. And the most determined woman I know, Senator Kristen Sinema. Congratulations, Kristen. Look, Committee Chair Tom Carper, Ranking Member Shelley Moore Capito. I also want to thank Minority Leader Mitch McConnell for voting for this bill and talking about how useful and important it is. And from the House of Representatives, Speaker Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, Jim Clyburn, and Committee Chair Pete DeFazio, Democrats and Republicans, progressives and moderates, I'd like to pause and ask all the committee chairs and ranking members of the United States Senate and House that are here today, please stand. Will all of you stand? Come on. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. To state the obvious, none of this would have happened without all of you. I really mean it. And also to the governors. Where are the governors? Governors, stand up. Come on, I want you to stand up. 
Red states, blue states, y'all contacted me. Y'all said you were for this. You all stepped up. And more than 375 mayors, Democrats and Republicans, from every state and District of Columbia, wrote me asking to get this done. You got it, kid. <laughs> And nearly 50 of whom are here today, including Republican Mayor Fontana, who uh, from California, from Fontana, from Cal Fontana, California, Mayor Warren, who uh, spoke earlier, and uh, county and state and tribal leaders as well, civil rights leaders, faith leaders, law. The, you know, this law was supported by business groups, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Business Roundtable, representing 200 of the largest corporations in America and other top business. I want to especially thank, and I'm sure you all, as we used to say in the Senate, I stand a point of personal privilege. I want to thank organized labor who understands this about jobs. You all stood up. Jobs, 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 jobs. Special thanks to the AFL-CIO, the United Auto Workers, the electrical workers, the IBW, the iron workers, it goes on, plumbers, pipe fitters, and the building trades, steel workers, who would I leave out? <laughs> Pardon me? And my wife is a member of the union, the NEA. I'm going to get in trouble. Machine is so many more. Look, folks, for too long, We've talked about having the best economy in the world. We've talked about asserting American leadership around the world with the best and the safest roads, railroads, ports, airports. Here in Washington, we've heard countless speeches and promises and white papers from experts. But today, we're finally getting this done. So my message to the American people is this. America's moving again and your life is going to change for the better. If you live in one of the top, if you live in one of the 10 million homes, or you're a child who attends one of the 400,000 schools or child care centers that still has lead pipes in them, you face a clear and present danger to your child's health and your health now. This law is going to start to replace 100% of the nation's lead pipes and service lines. So every American, every child can turn on the faucet and drink clean water and tens of thousands of plumbers and pipe fitters are going to get work done in good paying jobs. Folks, as, uh, as we saw with remote learning, remote working during the pandemic, access to high speed internet is essential and access to water as essential as access to water and electricity. This law is going to make high speed internet affordable and available everywhere, everywhere in America, urban, suburban, rural, and create jobs laying down those broadband lines. No parent. No parent, <laughs> excuse me, no parent should have to sit in a parking lot at a fast food restaurant again just so their child can use the internet to do their homework. That's over. And folks, if I visited your town, I'm sure you'd be able to tell me and where you hold your breath as you cross the particular bridge or where the most dangerous intersection in your town is. This law makes us the most significant investment in roads and bridges in the past 70 years. It makes the most significant investment in passenger rail in the past 50 years and in public transit ever. So what, what that means is you're going to be safer and you're going to get there faster. And we're going to have a whole hell of a lot pollution, less pollution in the air. The bipartisan law will modernize our ports, our airports, our freight rail to make it easier for companies to get goods to market reduce supply chain bottlenecks, as we've experienced now, and lower cost for you and your family. The law also builds on our resilience so that the next storm, superstorm, drought, wildfire, hurricane can be dealt with. Last year alone, the United States, as a consequence of these kind of extreme weather events, lost $99 billion in the United States alone in damage. After Hurricane Ida, I see the distinguished governor from Louisiana is over there. I saw him stand up. I went down to see him. We went through and saw all the damage there. They had 179 mile an hour winds at top speed in Louisiana. But then I headed on up to New York. Chuck, we're up in your area, in the Queens, in New Jersey. More people died there than in the hurricane. 
More people died with the flooding. Record wildfires raged and went. I went to Idaho and California and saw it. More land is burned to the ground than the entire state of New Jersey out west. Folks, walk the neighborhoods and look the people in the eye in these circumstances, as many of you have, and you'll see the despair and the heartache. So many of you understand. You're living through it. This law builds back our bridges, our water systems, our power lines, our levees, better and stronger. So few Americans will be flooded out of their homes or lose power in those days and weeks with the consequence of storms that hit. Folks, this bipartisan law, for the first time ever, creates a true national network of charging stations for electric vehicles, over 500,000 of them, so you can charge your car here and drive all the way to California, not worrying about having to find places to charge, creating thousands of jobs, thousands. It is also going to make it possible for Americans to get off the sidelines and into the game of manufacturing, solar panels, wind turbines, batteries to store energy and power for electric vehicles, including electric school buses, which will mean millions of children will no longer inhale the dangerous diesel fumes that come out of the buses. For real. It's a big deal. And it'll reward companies for paying good wages and for buying American sourcing their products here in America right now. It's going to help the United States export clean energy technologies to the world, creating tens of thousands of more jobs. There's so much more in the law, but most of all, it does something truly historic. I ran for president believing it was time to rebuild the backbone of this nation, which I characterize as working people in the middle class. They're the ones who built the country. And to rebuild the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. This law delivers on that long overdue promise, in my view. It creates better jobs, for millions of Americans, and no one, no one earning less than $400,000 a year will pay a single penny in federal taxes because of it. And it does not include, as we did the bipartisan infrastructure bill, it does not include a single penny in gas tax, which I rejected because people under $400,000 would be paying it. This law is a blue-collar blueprint to rebuild America. It leaves no one behind. And it makes, it marks an inflection point that we face as a nation. For most of the 20th century, we led the world by significant margin because we invested in ourselves. But somewhere along the way, we stopped investing in ourselves. We risked losing our edge as a nation. And China and the rest of the world are catching up. Our infrastructure used to be rated the best in the world. Now, according to the World Economic Forum, we rank 13th in the world. Well, that's about to change. Things are going to turn around in a big way. For example, because of this law, next year will be the first year in 20 years American infrastructure investment will grow faster than China's. We'll once again have the best roads, bridges, ports, and airports over the next decade. And we'll lead the world into the 21st century with modern cars and trucks and transit systems. We're going to do this by building again and moving again. Folks, too often in Washington, the reason we didn't get things done is because we insist on getting everything we want, everything. With this law, we, we focus on getting things done. I ran for president because the only way to move this country forward, in my view, was through compromise and consensus. That's how the system works. That's American democracy. And, and I'm going to be signing a law that is truly consequential because we were made our democracy delivered for the American people. We compromised. We reached a consensus. That's necessary. And now our focus moves to implementing an infrastructure law that's going to, with speed and with discipline. I have a lot of experience in doing that. When I was vice president, I was given responsibility for overseeing and implementing the Recovery Act for nearly $900 billion emergency package. I'm proud to say that when we finished implementing that Recovery Act, it was determined that there had been less than two-tenths of one percent waste, fraud, or abuse. And I was, and, and it was how I learned and earned the nickname Sheriff Joe from President Obama, because I made it a point every single day for well over a year to stay on top of how the money was being used. I spoke with over 160 mayors, two, three times sometimes. And I spoke with county executives and every governor save one. Well, I won't mention that. And save one. She could see Alaska from her porch, but 
uh, monitor what we're doing, to know just how it was being done. And it was one of the most efficient implementations of a major program in American history. And now we owe it to the American people to do the same thing again. And to make sure every penny is spent where it's supposed to go in a timely fashion, I've asked the former mayor of New Orleans and former lieutenant governor of Louisiana, Mitch Landrieu, to oversee this responsibility. He'll have full access to every tool the federal government has to get it done. And we have, we have the high obligation and responsibility to make sure this money is used wisely and used well. Folks, I've been looking forward to this day for a long time, like all of my colleagues here have. Tomorrow, I'll be traveling to New Hampshire to visit a bridge that is structurally not safe, like thousands of bridges across America. That's what this law is all about, keeping communities safer and more efficient. On Wednesday, I'll be in Detroit to meet with UAW workers who are building the next generation of electric vehicles. And that's just the beginning. We're also seeing me and the vice, you'll be seeing me and the Vice President Harris, Jill and Doug, cabinet officials, hitting the road to help you understand how this is going to transform your lives for the better. And folks, when you see those projects starting in your hometowns, I want you to feel what I feel, pride. Pride in what we can do together as the United States of America. Folks, you know, the same goes for my plan to build back better for the people, getting folks back to work and reducing cost of things like child care, elder care, housing, health care, prescription drugs, and meeting the moment on climate change. I'm confident that the House will pass this bill, and then we're going to have to pass it in the Senate. And that's fully paid for. It will reduce the deficit over the long term, according to the leading economists in the world. And again, no one earning less than $400,000 will pay a single penny more in federal taxes. And together, together with the infrastructure bill, millions of lives will be changed for the better. Folks, let me close with this. Throughout our history, we've emerged from crises by investing in ourselves. During and after the Civil War, as been referenced, we built the Transcontinental Railroad, uniting East and West and uniting America. During the Cold War, we built the interstate highway system, transforming how America lived their lives. And now we're emerging from COVID-19 pandemic and we'll build an economy for the 21st century. When I met with the president of China, who I'm going to be speaking with tonight several years ago, he asked me, we were in China, he asked me, he said, could I define America? And I said, absolutely. It's the God's truth. I said, absolutely. I can define it in one word possibilities, possibilities. There is no limit to what our people think we can do. And there is no limit to what our nation can do. And there is no one thing that I know more than this. It's never, ever been a good bet to bet against the American people. Never, never, never. <laughs> Given half a chance, the American people have never, ever, ever let this nation down. And it's our job to give our people that chance. It's our job to come together and make sure we remain a nation of possibilities. As I look out in this crowd today, I see Democrats and Republicans, national leaders, local leaders, all elected officials, labor leaders, business leaders, and most of all, I see fellow Americans. I see America. Let's remember this day. Let's remember we can't come together. Most of all, let's remember what we've got done for the American people when we do come together. I truly believe that 50 years from now, historians are going to look back at this moment and say, that's the moment America began to win the competition of the 21st century. So with confidence, optimism, with vision and faith in each other, let's believe in possibilities. Let's believe in one another. And let's believe in America. God bless you all and may God protect our troops. Now let me sign this bipartisan bill. President Biden on the South Lawn of the White House. He campaigned on this moment, saying Republicans and Democrats could work together, that he would deliver on infrastructure. After previous presidents had talked often about wanting to do the same. The president saying he's driven by kitchen table conversations across this country. What families need, jobs, jobs, jobs. Where do I get one? How do I get there? He talked about our infrastructure, now ranked 13th in the world, according to the World Economic Forum. He said that's going to change with this new law. And he said for the first time in 20 years, American infrastructure investment will grow faster than China's in the year ahead.
Well, folks, I'm going to get you each a pen, but there's 30 of you up here. I only have one pen. Let's break it in 30 parts. A historic moment on infrastructure, given how Washington has talked of this for, for many years now, but also historic in another way. We have not seen Democrats and Republicans in a forum like this gathered together surrounding a president, being willing to surround a president of another party in quite some time. The bill now signed. You saw him thank, uh, in a very public way, Senator Rob Portman, for example, of Ohio, the Republican, saying he's a heck of a guy. It wasn't exactly the word that the president used, but he said, I can applaud you in public because you're not running again, uh, with a laugh, though we know that is the reality uh, of politics in this country right now, a polarized country. But this is a win, a much needed win for this president who is aware of his approval ratings, the new ABC News Washington Post poll that broke over the weekend. President underwater at just 41 percent, and many Americans pointing to the economy uh, and to inflation, uh, something that affects everyone from the gas station to the grocery store. I want to get to our chief White House correspondent, Cecilia Vega. Cecilia, you've been reporting on this. This is a victory this administration surely needed. Yeah, it is, David. You know, you, you mentioned uh, infrastructure. It sort of became a, a, a running joke here in Washington, at least among many of the White House journalists, because it feels like we've been covering Infrastructure Week for so long now, even dating back to the Trump administration. And there certainly is a festive feel out here. We haven't seen this for this administration. This president hasn't had a legislative victory like the one that he is celebrating here today, particularly with all these Republicans. But you mentioned those polls, David. That is hanging over this administration right now. The president said he's going to go out and sell this. He's going to head to New Hampshire to go to this bridge that has been redlined. He later heads to Detroit where he's going to be talking about green energy vehicles. All of that covered in the bill that he is signing right now. But buried in that is that message that he gave to Americans when he was on the stage just behind me a few minutes ago. We see you. We hear you. He needs to get out there and convince Americans that bills like the one that he is signing here today are actually working for him because they are he is underwater in those public opinion polls. The White House very clearly has a disconnect. This bill is super popular. She has a huge public opinion uh, support in the, those public opinion polls. But the reality is those bills are more popular than the president is right now. So he has to get out there and convince them that, that, that this bill works for them, David. And with a few moments left, Cecilia, no surprise that the states he listed, New Hampshire uh, and Michigan, to start the battlegrounds. Certainly at battlegrounds and in that poll, I keep going back to that poll because it really is an important one, is a key figure in there. The fact that most Americans say that if the midterm elections were held today, they would vote to put a Republican in Congress. That is hanging over this White House right now. They know the political reality of this. This is a campaign promise that the president is making good on. He's now got to get out there. Those midterms, a year away, that's not that long in this town, David. Cecilia Vega, our chief White House correspondent on the South Lawn of the White House for this uh, historic moment, the signing of this landmark bipartisan infrastructure bill. One more question on this, and it goes to Rachel Scott, uh, who covers Congress for us every single day here. And Rachel, of course, the big question now is the second part of this infrastructure plan, the second part of his domestic agenda. You heard Senator Rob Portman, Republican there, making sure he, he drew a line in the sand with where uh, his support would go. Republicans obviously feel the same way uh, as the senator does. This is something that the president will not be able to afford to lose one Democratic vote on moving forward. That's exactly right, David. And so while we see the president at the White House today celebrating a bipartisan victory, there are significant challenges ahead because of those razor thin margins in both the House and the Senate. The president cannot afford to lose a single Democratic vote in the Senate. He can only afford to lose three in the House. He will have to keep his entire party united on this much larger social spending bill with funding for universal pre-K and for child care, money to combat climate change. The House is pushing forward they want a vote on this by the end of the week, but the pathway forward in the Senate is very unclear. Moderate, still at odds with progressives over the size and the scope of that package, David. But no question the president will take this victory today, a much needed one, a hard fought one for this White House. The president there uh, on the South Lawn with Democrats and the Republicans who showed up saying this is proof, despite the cynicism, uh, Democrats and Republicans can indeed work together. Our coverage will continue on ABC News Live, abcnews.com. For many of you, it's your local news in the East, and I'll be back with the entire team for World News Tonight. I'm David Muir in New York. We'll see you shortly. Good day.